The lazy sinews of the nations taught them. The armies were on the move. Peace exploded into cheers and music. In August 1914, Europe marched to war with rejoicing. Tense wires of apprehension were snapped. Those in every nation whose lives had been drab, who had endured discontents, who were restless, disgusted, filled with envy or with high ideals, a cause was now offered and a duty. Enthusiasm was reborn. Valleys green and still, where lovers wander maying, they hear from over the hill a music playing. Behind the drum and fife, past hawthorn wood and hollow, through earth and out of life, the soldiers follow. And down the distance they, with dying note and swelling, walk the resounding way to the still dwelling. It was Austria's quarrel, but it was Germany's war. Germany struck first, westward. At 5 a.m. on August the 4th, German cavalry crossed the Belgian frontier, their hoof beats on the cobblestones the signal of catastrophe. In Berlin, the Kaiser addressed the members of the Reichstag. I have no knowledge any longer of party or creed. I know only Germans, and in token thereof, I ask all of you to give me your hands. When the Imperial Chancellor, Bretmann Holweg, asked for the unprecedented war credit of 265 million pounds, the Reichstag voted it unanimously. Bretmann Holweg stated Germany's position in the clearest terms. Necessity knows no law. Anyone who, like ourselves, is struggling for a supreme aim must think only of how he can hack his way through. Through international agreements, through the very concept of neutrality, through Belgium. The invasion of Belgium was demanded by the Schlieffen Plan, the master plan by which Germany hoped to win the war. To avoid the French fortress system, the Germans would cross Belgium, pass through Brussels, swing down into France, brushing the Channel coast, pass round west of Paris and attack the French armies from behind. The whole thing was expected to be over in 40 days. One thing was vital to this plan, and that was speed. The point of first impact was Liège, blocking the crossings of the River Meuse and all routes to Brussels and the west. This strongly defended area had to be seized to open the way for the waiting masses of the great German field army, seized quickly and at whatever cost. Or, alternatively, defended at whatever cost. General Le Mans, commanding the garrison of Liège, had been instructed to do just that. The Belgian army was weak, ill-prepared, conscious that it could not face the power of Germany in the open field, but brave and willing to fight behind the defences which existed, or which could be hastily constructed. They 
They were facing the most powerful military machine in the world. The army was the embodiment of Germany's soul. All the hopes and all the pride of this young, expanding, thriving empire found expression in it. Every young man was liable to serve, and most of them were overjoyed to do so. When the army marched, all Germany marched too. In peacetime, it numbered nearly a million conscripts. Behind them stood over four million trained reserves, and a final potential of almost ten million. The backbone, as everywhere, was the infantry. 78 divisions drawn from the swelling cities, the famous old towns, the wide and various countryside of the German Empire. They were mostly peasants, sturdy, patient, brave, dependable. And their hard core was 110,000 superbly trained non-commissioned officers. The cavalry numbered over 100,000. They were the Kaiser's favorites, cuirassiers, Dragoons, Uhlans, with flat-topped helmets and fluttering lances. The Crown Prince's regiment was the Death's Head Hussars. But it was the German artillery which would shock the world and do the damage. The field guns were not impressive, but behind them were ranged over 3,000 weapons of heavier caliber. 150 millimeters, 210 millimeters, 305s, products of the firm of Krupps. It was a crushing weight of heavy guns, well supplied with shells, waiting to tear a continent apart. For a while, all this might was checked. Liège proved a tough nut. The first German assaults were repulsed with heavy losses. They tried a night attack to avoid the Belgian machine guns. Slipping through the outer ring of forts, an almost unknown German staff officer, General Ludendorff, made his way to the citadel in the center of the town itself. I arrived, no German soldier was to be seen, and the citadel was still in the hands of the enemy. I banged on the gates, which were locked. They were opened from the inside. The few hundred Belgians who were there surrendered at my summons. There was jubilation in Germany. The Kaiser kissed von Moltke rapturously. But the excitement was premature. General Le Mans was not in the citadel, he was in one of the forts, and under his firm direction, these continued to resist. The way to Brussels was still blocked. In the following days, the short pause while Germany's battering train assembled, the nations discerned the countenance of war. At this stage, many found it pleasing. The German crown prince wrote, The electric spark of the mobilization decree fired a train of indescribable enthusiasm from Memel to the tiniest hamlet in the southern German mountains. At that time, the vast majority of the German people regarded the military solution of the ever-increasing political tension as the end of a nightmare. A French officer was leaving Paris with his regiment for Verdun. Our great nation's heart was beating tumultuously as in days long past. Crowds were gathered at every station, behind every barrier, and at every window along our road. 